All right, good morning. My name's Richard, and uh, I'm excited about this message because I got I to gotta be honest with you. God changed it at the very last minute uh, so that we could reinforce what we're talking about. So I'm a little excited about that, but a little nervous too. And I, we got so much feedback. It took me days to get back on emails and, and inboxes and text messages. I just It took me a while to get back to people. So it really struck a, a chord with some people. It really moved them into thought and thinking uh, about where they are you know, in their spiritual walk. So uh, just to give you a recap, if you're, if you're brand new here, I'm, I hope you were warmly welcomed and all that. Um, but I really want you to get this so I just don't start talking and you, and you try to catch up. I just want to go ahead and, 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 and throw it at you. We're talking about uh, momentum. We're talking about that kind of momentum, that, that movement in your life that everybody wants from God. I think in the, no matter how far they are or feel from God, they want a connection with God. And things interrupt that connection with God. Sometimes we see people that were on fire for God and just you couldn't stop them from doing what God's called them to do. But something happened. Something happened. The feeling, a bad habit, a routine, something took them out and took their momentum away. And it is so hard to get back. It's so hard because we struggle with, with shame and guilt about that, right? And some people, we, we talked last week about some people just kind of check out of church. And there's a reason. because nobody talked about this thing called momentum. Okay, so we're, we're, it should be up, up on our website this week or we find it on Facebook or something from last week. It was really good and thought-provoking in that way. So we want to continue with that today. We're going to be in Mark chapter 4. Okay, so we're going to be looking and talking about things that, listen, threaten your momentum. And one of those things is fear. One of the things that, that come in in your life and just yank that, that progress, man, that you're making for God. You feel like God's pulling you near to Him. And something can interrupt that. So we're going to look in Mark chapter 4 if, you, if you've got your Bible. If you're new and don't have a Bible or anything like that, it'll be on our screen. But we're talking about how fear threatens your momentum. And how we're going to talk about why that happens and then how, how, to, how to face things that we face um, and, and, and be able to hold more tight to the momentum that God's put into us, okay? So I'm not talking about the kind of fear this kind of that scary, fun kind of fear that you, when you go to the movies, a scary movie. You know what I'm talking about? It's kind of fun, but scary. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something a lot more serious. And it is that, it's that fear that, that, that threatens your, your very joy, your very peace, your contentment. Okay? Things that in life, it just kind of gradually grips you tighter and tighter to where you, you fall into a routine and a rut, and, and it's hard to dig your way out of that. So that's where we're going to be today. And, and, and Mark, and uh, I, I don't want you to check out too early thinking that you've heard this before, because uh, we are talking about uh, Jesus and being and, and calming the waves and the wind. But I'm going to give you a few things I think is going to really help us as we look into our, the storms of life, the things that come at us, those unexpected things that, that threaten our livelihood and our, our life and our, our way of living uh, that we just don't totally shut down. Okay, so I, I started thinking nothing illustrates this better than children does about fear. Uh, my oldest girl, you saw Rebecca that, that spoke a little earlier. Uh, when she was a little kid, she was kind of fearless. Uh, I would try to, I'm, I know I'm going to get turned into DSS, but I like to scare kids. I like that. I like seeing how they respond to it. And I know that's bad, but uh, I, anyway, I like to scare them. And so Rebecca just had this natural way about her. She might get scared for a second, but she rebounds pretty quick. So when she's fearful of something, well, I'm jumping out. I've got a few examples if you want any. You probably don't. You do? Yeah? Okay. Um, I, would, I made it a pretty good routine to act like I would flush myself down the toilet. I'd get the kids to chase me. And so I'd, I'd say, I'm going to flush myself down the toilet. And the kids are like, no. So I take off running. I shut the door, but not lock. And I flush the toilet, get in the shower, and say, Ah. And they come in and stare in the toilet and think I'm in there, you know, and like, no, 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 no. So I, lo I love doing that. It's kind of fun and funny. Uh, but Rebecca was able to rebound from, so she's a little bit fearless. She would walk into a dark room. She would do that to get something that she needed. Uh, she knows to flick on the light and, and, and I, something about her, maybe it's something I put into her otherwise is that I'm going to, I'll kick somebody's tail if they mess with you. You know, I think she got that. Uh, Rachel was a little different. She's not in here, so I can say this a little more freely. Uh, Rachel uh, was scared of everything. 
Sorry. I was just kidding. I'm just kidding. She was afraid. Her eyebrows are like cartoon eyebrows. They come off her head. She, duh. It was really funny to watch her get scared. And the reason is, I'll go ahead and say it now. It's out in the open. Months ago, not years ago, she's 12 now, and still says sometimes, hey, will you watch me while I let the dogs out? Or I want to walk down to my room, which is down a hall into a room, but it's dark down the hall and in a room. So she still needed help from that. And, and, and even when she was a little girl, she would do that. And I'd say, honey, why are, you, why are you scared? Well, she'd say, monsters. And so i tell her two things. Number one, there's no such thing as monsters. Okay? That didn't help too much. And number two, daddy knows kung fu and every other martial arts. And I would never, ever, ever let something happen to you, ever. You don't know what the lengths I would go to to make sure that you won't get hurt. Now, that just didn't seem to work. You know what I'm saying? They just had to kind of grow out of it. And, but children will, will let you know when they are fearful. And in and, and, and a lot of ways, that, that's what we look at as a child. But, man, spiritually speaking, man, man I run into people and, and I'm there sometimes myself. Is When I see something uh, that maybe God wants me to do, he wants me to be obedient or bold in it, and I just lock up. I lock up. I hear that God is for me and with me and fights my battles and has called me to do something, but yet I still, I still have a lack of trust is what it boils down to. And so even though I reassured Rachel that there's no monsters and if, if anybody threatened her, I would, I would take them out. I would literally take them out. But, it, but just sometimes it's just not good enough. And sometimes when you're, as a father, and some of y'all might can relate, man, you never want your, I never want my daughters, you never want your children to walk around Afraid. You don't want them to walk around in fear, right? It's just not, as a father, that's, we want them to feel our protection and know that we would reinforce it, right? Are y'all with me? You know where I'm going with this? But at some point or another, our lack of trust in God leads to a loss of momentum. That could have easily been an application point. But listen, sooner or later, your lack of trust in God is going to help you to lose momentum. All right? It's going to affect it. God wants us to trust him so much. We are his children. And he wants us to, to walk with confidence and boldness that he's for us and with us. So when he calls us to something that we will execute. Okay? So, that's where we're going to be today in Mark chapter 4. And we're going to not just see how we can overcome fear, but how we can trust God in the storms of our life. In the, the, the situations that we maybe never even saw coming. What do we do in those moments? And we're going to learn from these guys, these disciples that go through this. We're going to learn from their failure. Have you ever watched people from a distance and learn from their failure? Saying, I'm not doing that. I love watching YouTube and people trying these crazy tricks, standing up on motorcycles and they fall. I'm like, I'll never do that. They're teaching me what not to do. So we're not just going to learn what not to do. We're going to learn what to do. Because listen, this is what I know. Is that you're going to face, we all are going to face, we do face these storms of life. None of us are immune to that. And we're going to see that. So I'm going to give you four things in just a minute. It's going to help us when we, when we hit those storms or maybe you're in the storm right now. It's going to help us along. It's going to help us be more obedient, more impactful uh, in the circles of people around us, okay? So I'm going to start reading. I want you to really pay attention to the words that Scripture uses because God loves us so much. He's handing this to us right now. And here's what, here's what it says in Mark chapter 4 in verse 35. It says, That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let's go to the other side. What he's talking about is a lake, okay? He's at, it's actually the Sea of Galilee. And what Jesus has been doing is his that day. It means, hey, all day, that day. He had been performing miracles, healing people, teaching people, doing the things that Jesus does. And he says, you know what? I want us to go to the other side. Let us go to the other side. Now, I looked up just about, you know, it's more of a lake than a sea because it's about 17 miles wide and, and about 7 miles long. Okay, so it's, it's, it looks more like a lake, but that's still pretty big. He said, let us go to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. Talking about Jesus. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up. That means a storm, a, a storm like we've never seen before. Okay, it says a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. That means it almost nearly overtook. 
Maybe that sounds like some of your situations that maybe you've been in or maybe you're in right now. And most of us will always experience that at some point in our life that it almost overtook it. It was more than they'd ever seen or were ever prepared for. And they're facing this now. It says Jesus was in the stern. That's down below. They had a little thing, right? Down below, uh, sleeping on a cushion. He had a pillow. He had a pillow. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Do you even care if we drown? All this is going on. We're scared to death. Don't you care if we drown? He got up, talking about Jesus. He rebuked, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Rebuke, meaning he, he confronted the wind and the waves. And he said, Quiet and be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. So let's pray. Y'all still looking at me? Pray. <laughs> God, we're gathering today, Lord, to hear from you. Lord, we expect to hear from you. God, we believe you have instruction, specific instruction for us, Lord. Maybe you're preparing us for something, Lord, that's coming our way. Maybe you're speaking to people, God, that are in the middle of a storm, uh, an overwhelming situation in their life, Lord, that they know they weren't prepared for. So, God, we know you want to speak truth into us, and you want to encourage us, and you want to move us forward. And, God, you're doing that today. You love us so much. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God, I want to start out just right out of the gate. I want to start out with this application point. Everything's going to revolve around this for the rest of the morning. Momentum shifts. That means as you move and change, as you... As you're moving forward towards God, whether you slow down or speed up, are determining how you view what you're going through. I tried to make it rhyme to make it easy. Momentum shifts are determining how you view what you're going through. Okay? It's how you look, how you perceive a situation. When, when, when the storms in, in inevitably come your way, whether it stops you in your tracks and you don't do anything more for, for the Lord, okay? Or it speeds you up. All right? So, momentum shifts are determining how you view what you're going through. So I want to give you four things, four things this morning that, that are either going to protect or create some momentum for you. Maybe you, just, you just, maybe you just got saved this past week at camp. Maybe it was last week you were one of the ones that raised your hand and said, I want to accept Christ. Maybe you've been at this a long time. You gave your life to Christ years ago, and you're trying to find that momentum. You found Revolution Church, and you said, this is what I need. I need to move forward. I, want, I, want, I feel like God's moving. But how do I, how do I face these storms, these, these unforeseen circumstances that come at me? How do I respond to that? What do I got to keep in mind? What do I have to have tattooed on my brain as it comes? Because it's going to be so important how you view that. Okay? And it's nothing that you can really gain perspective in that moment. Sometimes that's a little late. Okay? So God's trying to give this this beforehand. And maybe it's, you've been through a storm. And God's starting to surround people around you. He's giving you impact and influence. And he's trying to give you something to speak into the lives of other people that don't have momentum. That don't have uh, that, that, that peace and that purpose from God. And God wants to put something inside of you so that when you leave here, that when you intersect with those people, you'll have something so awesome to say that God put into you. Okay? So we all should be really hanging on the edge of our seats, not because of what I'm doing, but when God speaks. When God's willing and, and, and wanting to speak to us. So, I'm going to show you those four things that, you know, how do we face these things that, that, that threaten our family, our life, our, uh, our circumstances. You know, what do we do in those moments? So, here's the first one. The first one is this. Four things to know about a storm. That's not LED. Somebody, Josh said, is that LED like the lights? I said, no, oh, no. It's I am led. I am led, like leading. God is leading us um, into situations. So number one is when we're facing those storms, we're facing, here comes that, that this overwhelming thing in my life. Number one, I've got to keep in mind, I am led. God has led me into this. If you're a follower of Christ, now if you're not, I don't know what to tell you other than become a follower of Christ. Because when we are, when we've given our life to Him and He's in charge of every area of our life, 
because that's what following is. It means that he's leading. It means any circumstance that we're put into, it's because we were led there. It's not by accident. It's not that it took God by surprise. Okay, just because it's unexpected for us does not mean it's uh, uh, unexpected for God. We got to keep in mind, I'm in this circumstance. God is with me. He has led me here. He has, he has brought me into this scenario. So when we know that, we start to, uh, peace starts to happen with us to realize, because here's what Jesus, Jesus has deposited. He has created a spirit that would be within us. So when we go places, when we do things, when we experience things, we are led there. We didn't stumble there by accident, if you're a follower of Christ, okay? And so we got to understand that because here's what happens. Sometimes the voice and opinions of a lot of preachers and teachers have us to believe that in every scenario, if we're experiencing something bad, bad things are happening to us, then it must be because we're not following Jesus. And maybe you've got a friend like I've got a friend at work who found out that uh, kind of what I do. I didn't really say the extent of it. He thinks I'm in ministry. He doesn't know all this goes on. But he counts on me, and, and, and he's really hit some bad things. And here's what happened to him. A very bitter divorce. His wife's uh, being pretty rough about it with the children. Um, he is probably going to lose his job out of just uh, downsizing. Uh, a lot of rough things that are happening to him. And he said, I said, well, you got somebody you talk to, man. Is there somebody you go to church anywhere? He said, well, yeah. I had a pastor. I went to him, and he told me that, well, if all that's going on, you must be sinning in some way. Now, with all due respect, I want to punch that dude in the face. Right? Can you do that with all due respect? I would, because it's not the case. I'm thinking, what are you teaching these people? Are you reading Scripture? I want to say, where, where are you getting your information? Because Matthew 5, 45 says this. This is to encourage you. This is to encourage you. This is, he calls, it's talking about God, the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. What does that mean? That means bad days happen. It means things happen. It's going to happen. You can't be immune. We're not in this bubble. We're not in this, when you step into uh, giving your life to Christ, that you're automatically inoculated to everything that, that life has to offer. As a matter of fact, most of y'all could probably get up here one after another and say, hey, man, when I decide to be obedient to, to God with my life, okay, just surrendering my, my life and my heart and putting him in charge of me, or when I started giving, when I started serving, all of those things, man, you, you would, you, it, right behind that would be, hey, man, I felt attacked. Right after that, I felt attacked. And that's what happens. And so... Um, Sometimes we do get into a storm in our own choosing, don't we? Sometimes when we're disobedient. Sometimes when we do things that we know God's not called us to do and we, we, we try to make our own path, our own trail, and that does happen, but not necessarily so. And maybe you come from that background where if you, if you are experiencing any type of discomfort and pain and attack, that you must not be following Jesus. I just want to tell you that's false. That's false. It should free you up a little bit. Because here's something that I think it'll pop up. You can be right in the middle of the will of God and still be in a storm. you got to believe that. So when you see your circumstances happening, oh God, here's a storm. You've, been, you, you've given your life to Christ. He is with you. He's put a spirit in you. And he's putting you, you are led there with a purpose. You can, you can be right in the middle of the will of God and still be in a storm. And I'm going to prove it to you. We watch these disciples as we read that, that scripture, and the disciples are right in the middle of the will of God. Jesus said, he said it himself. He, it was his idea. Look, I've been pastoring, preaching, healing people all day. Now let's get in the boat and go to the other side. That's what he did. So these people are smack dab in the middle. That's kind of Gastonia terms, isn't it? In the middle of God's will, and they're in a storm. Now, first of all, what you've got to think about is Jesus... If you think I'm long-winded, I've heard that. But if Jesus was your pastor, that's really long-winded. Then you might appreciate me a little bit more. But he had been preaching all day long. And so maybe they thought he was so tired, and as he uh, was, they were going to go across here, it's all going to be rest, right? It's all going to be, we're just going uh, to take naps, right? But this is his idea. Jesus decided 
that this was the course, this is where we're going, and they were in the middle of the process of doing what he called them to do. And yet here comes this storm, and they found out this is the storm of their life. This is the big kahuna, right? And so some of you are in that boat. I know I've, I've watched you. You've really uh, you started serving. We had so many people sign up for a new area, or they were new. Uh, uh, they want to be on serve teams uh, for the first time. And so we're going through that, and we're, we haven't forgot about you. We're going to be co- contacting you this week to move you into that. And some of you started giving for the first time. I know that. I, I know that it happens. I don't go looking at everything. But some of you come up and say, hey, man, I started giving, man. I, I feel freed up. Or, hey, man, it's been tough for me, but I gave anyway. That is awesome. So I know you've been under attack. But these guys were being led in this moment by God. And here's what you've got to know about these disciples is most of them, not all of them, were fishermen by trade. Ever since they were in little Bible diapers, uh, when they were old enough to walk, they had been around this lake, this Sea of Galilee. They knew it. They had fished it. They know it. They've, they've been on it. So this is nothing new to them. As a matter of fact, this was a generational trade to be a fisherman, which means, hey, man, if they were a fisherman, then their dad was a fisherman. And their granddad was a fisherman. See what I'm saying? So they knew this. They knew this lake. They had probably had more, been a part of more storms than they could even count. But this one was overwhelming. This was the big one, and, and they were freaking out. And so they, look, they go and look for Jesus. Okay? They start doing their own hustle first. No doubt they would probably put the, the oars in there and probably readjust the, the sails and all that you would try to do when you see a storm coming, right? Because we all try to lean on what we can do. But they saw that this time in their life, maybe like in your life, is, man, you know, I've handled a lot of things in life. I've overcome a lot. But this one is more than I can handle. For some of you, it's, hey, man, your career, you had it all mapped out. Maybe some of you went to college and it, it sounded good at the time, and it, uh, but, but things aren't maybe going like you planned. Maybe it's your marriage. You thought, man, if I got married, uh, it would fix a lot of relationship issues that I have. But you don't know how to fix it, and you don't know anybody else that can help you fix it. Maybe it's a financial situation. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this mess. I don't know any millionaires, right? And so they're in this situation, and they're trying to do everything on their own, and they realize this storm is way bigger than them. So they go and wake Jesus because Jesus is the one that got them into this, right? And, and they, when they get down there, they, say, they find him asleep. And in Mark chapter 4, it says that he's asleep on a cushion or on a pillow. And I don't know about y'all, I like one for my head folded in half and one over my leg and make sure Holly's scratching my back. I like, I like four pillows. I'm a pillow man. So me and Jesus got a lot in common. So here's what's interesting. When he gets up, I love awkward. I, I know y'all know that, but I love it. And I'm good with awkward silence. I create it sometimes. But Jesus, they find him falling asleep. I, I want you to see what they, they don't question Jesus about. And that was his ability. Okay? They didn't question his ability. Can he do something about this storm? That's why they went to him. Hey, what are we going to do? What can you do about this? Have you ever noticed people that are freaked out, something's wrong, they want everybody else around them to freak out? They wanted Jesus to freak out, but he's not freaking out. He's cuddled up with a pillow. And they said, Jesus, uh, what are we going to do? Wake up. You're sleeping. Because he, they knew he had the ability. It wasn't that. Okay, because he had been healing people and doing all these crazy things that they see. They've been around him enough to know. Okay, that he has authority. And so what they did, though, is they questioned whether or not he cared. They questioned his concern for them, his compassion for them. Okay? So it's not it was an ability. I bet a lot of people are there. I think a, most of you, man, I believe God can say what he says he's going to do. I just don't think it's for me. I don't think, I don't, I'm not sure that he has enough care for me and my scenario. Almost as if God is holding back in your circumstance. You know where I'm going? So, number one is, when we face a storm, we've got to know that we're led there. We've got to know that, that, that it's not by accident. We're not alone. God's got something up his sleeve and that he wants us to know that we're led. And number two is, 
We got to know when we face these storms that we're loved. That we're loved. That God does care about us. And He does. And they question His heart and His character and His compassion. And most of us, because at the heart of, of uh, fear is a mistrust of God. So we struggle with whether He is willing, willing to do something, or able to do something. Okay? And it comes back to when I talked about Rachel. My daughter is just that I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure you're okay. But then hear me, yeah, but I'm still scared. I'm still scared. But we have to know that we are loved. So Jesus gets up from his nap and he rebukes the winds and the waves. Now, I'm kind of honestly, I've got to be honest, I would be rebuking them. You know what I'm saying? Is anybody like me? You mess up my nap, I'm coming at you. Is anybody like that but me? Is I'm just crazy? When I get woken up, you can beat me with a stick. You know what I'm saying? You can not feed me. But if I wake up from a nap, I don't know why. I'm supernaturally irritable. I don't know what it is. I just can't stand it. But Jesus didn't rebuke them, even though he got woke up from his nap. He's got more patience than I do. And he wakes up from a nap, and, and he, he looks right at them, and he, said, and he questions their faith. He questions their faith. He says, why are you so afraid? What he's saying is, don't you trust me? So they, they misinterpreted his inactivity because he didn't freak out with apathy. Because it felt like God wasn't doing anything or didn't look like he was, that he was just apathetic, like he did not care. Right? And they, they misinterpreted his, his peace that he had. He's cuddled up to that body pillow, right? He's cuddled up to they They've mistaken his peace, the peace that he had, for passivity. I thought I was going to forget that. But listen, listen. Jesus is saying, man, I'm, this thing is planned. It's all planned out. There's no need for you to freak out in your situation. I know this storm is right on top of you and you're scared. But don't be. Because it's in full control. And Jesus, yeah, that's true. So maybe this whole nap taking thing wasn't just a nap, not just because he didn't care. But maybe it was helping him to understand how to handle the storm. How to handle these circumstances that we all face. Some of those things you verbalize, some of these things you'd never mention to another soul. But it's got you shackled, and man, you can't even think about. It. You can't even put your mind into serving or giving or doing, doing something for somebody in your life because it consumes you. It's, it's a furious squall, and it's swamped your life. And so you, you can't make one, one move or another, okay? And maybe, maybe Jesus is just trying to teach us, you know, hey, man, I'm cuddled up with a pillow. And some, some of you, that'd be the best thing for you to do. Maybe at work, everybody's freaking out because they're losing their job. It's just you to lay down and take a nap, metaphorically. I'm not telling you not to work. But just, man, we're, we're all going to lose our jobs. I'm like, man, maybe we will. But, you know, I know as I walk into a storm like that, that that God has absolutely something for us, something specific. He's in control of this whole thing. And some of you, that's the most spiritual thing you can do, okay, is to take a nap, metaphorically, okay? And that is to know that God is in charge. Know that He, listen, that He led you there and that He loves you. He loves you. He'd already proven that to us when he died on the cross for our sin. I, I love you. People that don't love you are not going to die on the cross for your sin. You see what I'm saying? All right? They're just not going to do it. But we freak out and we try to manage it. What, what, what can I do here? Maybe I can shift some money here. Maybe I can get three jobs. Maybe I can work, you know, a million hours. Or maybe I can go to church every other week. That way I can get the rest that I need. You know, I'll try to manage that. Right? And sometimes you just get in a situation where you cannot manage. And sometimes you're avoiding a storm when God wants to teach you something. Okay? Because there's something that he wants to teach us. So we've got to know that we're loved, that God hasn't forgot about me. He doesn't. He, he, he knows where I am, and he knows what my feelings are, and he's got the best for me. He's planned it all out. So we've got to know that we're loved. So we've got to know that we're led. Here comes a storm. I'm in it, or here it comes. God's in control. He led me here. He's the one that, 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 that brought it to me because I've given my life to him. And i got to know that he loves me. And number three is this. Four things to know about a storm. When you're in it or you see it coming, 
is that it will eat your lunch, is I am learning. When you're a storm, you got to pull this out. Man, I'm learning. This is a learning opportunity for me. What do I mean by this? Because in in, when, when you read Scripture, you see most of the people in Scripture are going through, through something really overwhelming. So this is a pattern of God that He... He moves and, and, and pulls the best out of people and positions them out of difficult circumstances that they can't handle on their own. So it's almost, man, it could be looked at like a promotion. God's trying to promote me. He's trying to give me new territory. He's trying to give me more influence. But first, got to go through this storm. And I'm proud of all our, our people that passed this year or graduated from Revolution Church, I mean, from their high schools and middle schools. That's great. But you had, didn't you have to pass a series of tests to graduate or to move to the next level. And God said, I want to give you this, but there's certain things I'm trying to put in you. This is, this is me trying to teach you. And so most of us aren't going to be on a small little boat out in the middle of a sea. This is metaphorical, okay? But we are going to be in circumstances in our life where it just becomes overwhelming. So here's what I want you to jot down, if you would. It's storms are an opportunity for people to learn. It's when we learn new lessons about, listen, about God, about who He is, what His nature is, what His character is. Right? We're learning in those moments. And then we're learning about ourselves. You can really learn something, something about somebody, where they are, spiritually, emotionally, when they face a storm. So here's the application point. It's my favorite one of the day is a storm reveals things we try to conceal. When a storm comes, it does something, it shakes us up, and it reveals things that we try to conceal. And here's what I mean by that. Man, it can feel, and we can put on or really feel like, that we really got things together. That we really got the tiger by the tail. We got this thing figured out, but when a storm comes, and that, that tiger turns around and, and bites you. You see what I'm saying? It tells on us, man. It's in those moments where I don't know what to do. I'm like a baby in diapers. I have no idea. I'm at the mercy of this storm. And so what it does, it, it helps us to become, number one, more self-aware. Where we are spiritually. Have you ever seen somebody, man? I'm not poking fun. Maybe I am. Not anybody here. But I've been in situations where people that they, something hits them and it's, it's, a, it's a rough situation and they start praying natural thing to do but praying in King James Version you know what I'm saying there's something holy about praying in King thy Lord thou thyest those God and I'm not making fun of it but some people it's when they get in those situations you see that man they're not used to or comfortable speaking to God and God will take any prayer that we have he really will right no matter what, where it comes from, how desperate you are. But it'll let you know, man, God wants way more of that from you. It doesn't have to be fabricated. It doesn't have to be an emergency situation. It can be at any time. So we learn about ourselves. Then we learn about God. It makes us more God aware. And we just figure out, man, God's talking to me. He's, he, and we go into those storms that he's trying to work something in me and through me. Okay? And when we learn those lessons, when we, I would be, it's hard to say this, but sometimes, man, a storm just does something to you that grows you. It's something to it. Okay? And I'll give you an example. I got a buddy that's a weatherman down at uh, Myrtle Beach. Okay? Meteorologist, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, you know, you can ask a meteorologist about lightning. You know what I'm saying? Because I almost got struck by lightning last week, right? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to tell you that. I should have put it on Facebook. But I felt like it popped like 50 yards from me. I thought, man, I could have died. I didn't get struck. But if you have to ask a meteorologist about lightning, I mean, he'll tell you all kinds of things about it. It'll be interesting. It'll be helpful. You'll understand it better. But when you talk to somebody that's actually been struck by lightning, you know what I'm saying? Won't they give you a different perspective? Does that make sense? So listen, here's what I'm saying is when you go through storms, there's something God does to you that when you come out of that storm, or maybe you're in the middle of it, you've got something to say. You've got some experience. You've been there. So that's at least something God is doing to you so that when you speak, you speak with authority. You speak from experience. 
So this storm's not for nothing. Okay? There's something in it. He's making us more aware of Him and more aware of ourselves. And some of us prolong this, don't we? Don't we prolong our time in a storm? When there's obviously a, a step that God wants us to take, you might be prolonging some of that. Because there's something that He really wants to put in you and something He wants, to, wants you to respond to. Okay? This is the last one. It's a little weird. I'm almost done. The fourth thing, four things to know about a storm. It's when you face a storm, it threatens your momentum, but if you, if you, if you embrace this, it's going to help you. It's going to help move you forward, not lose your momentum, and actually gain momentum, is I am leaving. Okay? So number one, when you face a storm, it's I am led, I am loved, and I'm learning. God's got me in here. He's teaching me something. Don't freak out teaching you something about him and about you. And the last one is I'm leaving. I couldn't think of anything else. I'm leaving. And what I want to say to you is if you are in a storm or coming out, is that it's not, that's not the end of your story. That's not the way it ends. We have to have gain that perspective that there is more behind this. This is just part of my story. When you speak to people, when you encounter people, and you tell them about the love of Jesus, you're probably going to have a storm story attached to it. I want to tell you that it w it's not the end of the story. God's got more for you. There's life after the story. And here's what I want to say to you. And this is the last application point. Is your purpose is on the other side of the storm. Okay? God's going to allow something to happen in your life and he's trying to accomplish so much in that it's not a, a time that he is distant from you if you're if you're a follower he's trying to draw you near to him he's trying to put things into you he's trying to pull things out of you and mold you into who he's called you to be and I know at Revolution Church we need this very badly we know that this is a, God's doing a lot of filtering of peoples because he's called us to accomplish so much and it's coming and coming fast but I'd be afraid to go into that knowing that our people man that they haven't heard what God says about their storms because we're going to face some storms as a church as a as individuals and we just need to know how to go through them God is teaching us something right and here's what I want to end with is after this story uh, this encounter that Jesus had with the, his disciples and the, the storm. They got out of the boat on the other side and they ran into this guy that was demon-possessed. This guy was so pitiful. They had just finished the storm and right when they step off the boat, there's this guy. He's crazy. He's demonic. He's cutting himself with rocks, beating himself up. He's isolated. And Jesus comes and speaks to him and restores him. All right? And this guy, he said, yeah, I want to go with you. He, uh, you know, after Jesus restored him, he was clothed and in his right mind. He says, I, I want to go with you and your disciples. I want to go and do what you do. And Jesus says, no, you stay here. You go back to your hometown and, and, and tell them what's been done for you. And so what's happened is, listen, Jesus already knew why they were going to the other side of the lake. He knew that there would be a storm there. They didn't. But Jesus had a plan. He's got it all planned out. And their purpose from going from one side of the lake to another was to, look, look, be a part of the life change of this guy that was very far from God. So I don't want to make it too difficult to understand is, listen, whatever it is you're going through, whatever that, that, that threatens your content and your comfort and, and all those things, that God is amazingly at work in that very moment.